so great to be with you guys. It really is. And thanks for having us. Just great to uh, kind of renew fellowship with David and uh, his family. You, you might not know this, but years back, Sheila and I were praying for David. When I first met David, he was like your typical bachelor. Do you remember David, those heady days? And I, I can remember going in his house or manse, whatever it was, and I can remember thinking, there's no pictures on the walls here. There's like it so didn't have the feminine touch. So Sheila and I prayed for him. And uh, glory to God. Look at what God's done. The power of prayer is a wonderful thing. It's great to be with you. As I say, um, you know, I've got half an hour, and I'm going to really stick to that half an hour to the very best of my capability. Uh, I never really have a problem with people put a time on me for preaching. I just speak quicker, so you get the same thing, but you just got to listen a bit more <laughs> intently. I mean it. It's, it's a fault I've got. Um, but yeah, I, I noticed on the thing as well, it says I'm a Pentecostal preacher. Yeah, pastor. Uh, so is Paul, by the way. But um, Wesley, when you study Wesley, I'm a Wesley, I think Wesley's one of my heroes, right? So Wesley was one of the most classic Pentecostals you'll ever meet. Well, you, you will meet him one day. But he, like, he's out on his horse, and he's got to do all these thousands of miles. I think his horse died or something three times, and he just prayed over him and raised him up again, and just amazing, amazing character. So uh, I'm here today with several hats on, and uh, hang on a minute, it's asking for my face ID, there we are. I'm here with several hats on today, and um, here is a friend, here is uh, here for compassion, uh, but here most of all as a preacher of the Word of God, believing that God wants to bring transformation into this house today. Just want to say hi to you guys uh, on on the live stream as well, or if you're following this uh, later on, um, this message is for you, it's for all of us, it's for me as well. How many of you really believe that God changes lives today? I mean, genuinely believe God changes lives today. How many of you believe that you, you haven't got enough yet of what God wants to give you? How many of you believe that? So we're in the right house, right? And I, I genuinely believe, I, the only reason I'm here is because I believe in the power of the gospel, and I believe that God is still transforming lives today. So this this has been in the diary of God this day since before the foundation of time. He knew we'd all be here. He knew you guys would be on the live stream. So let's take encouragement from that and believe that God's going to change us and we're going to leave this place different to how we come in. See, if I was in a Pentecostal church now, they'd all go, Amen, brother, you preached that. All right. I know you're with me. <laughs> there we go. That's more like it. Just for information's sake, it costs £28 a month to sponsor a child. And uh, I haven't got time to show that video, unfortunately, but you might want to show it a bit later. Have you got it queued up? You have got it queued up. Do you want to watch another video? Are you all right? Three minutes. Three minutes. This is the video that called me out of a 27-year ministry in a growing church in Cornwall. This is the video that changed me. Here we go. Meet Richmond. When I was eight years old, my father was taken away from us. And by that, I mean he was murdered. Nothing was the same for me. News began to come to our doorstep. From our landlord, we got word that we couldn't stay in the house that we stayed anymore because we couldn't afford it. My mother had no job. My father was the only breadwinner. We moved from where we stayed to a place called Naguru Kasenke, which is one of Uganda's largest slums. And then I was introduced to our new home, which was a 12 by 12 room. I looked up on the roof. It was a tin roof that had holes in it. I've been to places where when it rains, people are happy. They get excited. But for me growing up, whenever it rained, that was the night that we would stay standing. Get little buckets, place just where the holes in the roof are, and wait until morning. A reality hit me that day. This was life. I remember when my mom said to us, there was no money for food. 
that ushered us into a place where we were now going to begin to go to the street to fend for food. Hunger began to set in, lack of water. I was a kid, I, I didn't have time to be a child anymore. As I lived like this on a daily basis, poverty began to speak to me as a child. I felt I was nothing. I didn't matter. Nobody cared to know my name. I think the best way I could describe who I was and what I thought is the word hopeless. My mother in tears uh, approached one of her friends just to share with her friend and her friend shared with her about compassion. Compassion staff members immediately came to our home. Uh, I remember them coming with uh, just uh, files to, to, to get details of who we were, what our story was. I got a news that a young lady, Heather, she was 15 years old, a teenager. She had decided to sponsor me. I cannot find the words to describe the joy that filled our home when we got the news. Richmond, you've got a sponsor, which means you can now go back to school. It means food will be given to us because of you. I began to walk into that reality that ushered in me an opportunity to rekindle this hope that was taken away. Heather began to write to me, to hear words like, Richmond, I love you. Richmond, I'm praying for you. They began to bring healing into places that were destroyed by voice, poverty, and my self-image. I remember my day, June the 3rd, 1996. I walked forward to accept the Lord Jesus in my heart. Mm -hmm. I began to feel, wow, I have been released from poverty. I have been released. Mm -hmm. God began to continue to grow the leadership within me. And then I felt fully called to pursue pastoral ministry. I began the Pastors Discipleship Network, a ministry that exists to train and equip pastors. And I spend a lot of my life training and equipping pastors in the Word of God. Looking back into my life and thinking where I am right now and what I am doing, I don't think any of this would have been possible without compassion. Compassion works. Everything that was placed within the program has helped build me to who I am right now. Poverty is not just the lack of money, the lack of material, food and water. Poverty is in, it's deep. I credit a lot of how I feel now about myself to those letters that I received from my sponsor. My name is Richmond Wondera, and I was released from poverty in Jesus' name. Building program, we had to put a new in front of big Methodist building that we purchased from the Methodist movement. It took me a year to get that, to get that through the buildings committee, to get the buildings committee to agree to the half million that we need. And this was on the back of a million something refurb. And it was ridiculous money now looking back. And after a year of that, I sat down that night when we got the decision yes, and I watched that video. And I thought to myself, I've spent my life raising leaders. And a 15-year-old girl, a 15-year-old girl, 15 years old, raises a man who currently between four and 5,000 pastors have been released through his ministry. I couldn't even get near it. I couldn't even get my head around it. And it was at that moment where I knew that God wanted me to change what I was doing. After 20, whatever it is here, 26, 27 years, Sheila and I stepped out of running uh, arguably the best church in Cornwall, apart from the Methodist church that David used to run. Um, and uh, we stepped into this new ministry. Just for information's sake, uh, currently through, um, through free Methodist churches, 200, over 200 children are sponsored. Isn't that incredible? And that means that you've provided, let me get this, uh, over a quarter of a million hours of Christ-centered 
uh, one-on-one with children in our project. Incredible. 68,000 nutritious meals have been provided because of free Methodist churches. Astonishing, isn't it? Come on, you've got to be a bit encouraged, haven't you? There we go. There's a, there is a Pentecostal in the house. I knew there'd be one somewhere. All right, so my job is to bring the word to you today. And um, thanks for me waxing lyrical a little bit there. Um, uh, I've told you who I am. I've told you kind of what we do. Um, now I want to bring to you uh, the Word of God. I've been uh, ill, or I was ill, for six months. And um, I, I actually at one stage they said they thought I'd got um, T3 stage T3 cancer. So, And this is like four or five months ago. I can't remember when it was now. I haven't. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Come on. The man at the back. Do I hear a woohoo? <laughs> the three a sermon. <laughs> um, and I can remember in that time thinking, I, I need God to touch me. Now, I wasn't scared about dying, particularly. I wasn't fussed about the process that I had to go through. But it hit me, um, I need a touch from God. I need God to step into this. I need to know that God's with me. Do you know what I mean? And um, I, I won't tell you about the whole journey. But my point is this. There was a point where God intervened in my life. If you look at our friend Richmond on here, there was a point where God intervened. Intervention is such an important word. Intervention comes when we are helpless, when we, have, when we need help, when something is beyond us. You'll have heard of the word intervention, incidentally, if you hear about somebody, and there might even be somebody in this room or within earshot of what I'm sharing online, where somebody where you've got a control, life-controlling situation. You could be an alcoholic. My brother died of alcoholism. And I can remember that there were several times we had to have an intervention. He couldn't help himself, so we intervened. We stepped in. Whether he wanted us to or not wasn't the issue. He needed an intervention. So we stepped in beyond self-help. So an intervention takes place when an individual lacks the capacity to overcome a problem. How Bible is that? Come on, we're celebrating Christmas. Jesus came. We celebrate that time when Jesus came. That is God's intervention into a world that was hopeless, had no hope. God sent His one and only Son. Why? So that we might be delivered from sin. And not only delivered from sin, here's the really good news, we get a robe of righteousness. We're made perfect. It's the divine transference that takes place, a theological theme that is beyond imagination. All the scholars in the world will never plunge the depths of how incredible that is. Now, here's the thing. That word intervention literally means to come between. And it is translated, actually, from the Latin word intercession. When you hear the word intervention, you can swap that over for the word intercession. When we intercede for someone, you're interceding for your community. I've heard that. Uh, you are actually, that's an intervention. They are helpless. They are lost. They have need, but you are standing in the gap. That's exactly what happened. The purpose of the church, I believe, the purpose of the gospel is to intervene, is to stand in the gap for a world that has so many issues and so many problems. Jesus coming is one of the most beautiful things that we can ever, ever celebrate. One of the saddest verses of the Bible, I think, is in Ezekiel 22.30, where it says this. God says, I look for someone among them who will build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. And then he says this, but I found no one. I made up my mind that I want to be the one. If he's looking, I want to put my hand up. God is a God of intervention. He intervened through the church, the best hope that this community, Kingswood, or your community, wherever you're watching this from, 
is the church of God. That's one of the things I love about compassion, is it works through the local church. We, we exist to empower local church. In the field, all the children go to a church. Everything we do is based in the church. And over here and in Australia and the States and uh, all, all the other kind of countries that are latched in with us, that work with us to release these children from poverty, it's all done through the local church. That is God's mechanism for bringing his intervention. He works through the church. The church is a church of intervention. Do you know what? If I plant another church, it will be called Intervention. How about that? Intervention Church. Isn't that a great, cool name? Don't you go stealing that. Intervention Church. Doesn't that sum up Jesus? Intervention. An individual lacks the capacity to overcome an issue. In this room today and online, some of us, in fact, all of us, to one degree or another, will be facing things that we cannot overcome. You could be listening to this. Maybe you've got issues in your family. Maybe you've got issues with your health, like I had. Maybe you've got financial difficulties. Maybe you've got an addiction, a besetting something that is dragging you down and ruining your life. You need an intervention. You need, you need a divine intervention for God to step in. Fifteen-year-old girl transformed the man of God's life. We're going to just listen or read Isaiah chapter 59 and... Um, as I go through this, it, it's, a, it, it's, um, it's quite kind of heavyweight, um, but it does get better, believe me. Uh, check in with these crazy glasses I've got here. Isaiah 59. You know you're getting old when. Here we go, Isaiah 59, 1. Father, bless this word to us, we pray. I pray, God, that your word will find, will take root and bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Here we go. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads a case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments. They utter lies. They conceive trouble, give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers, spin a spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die. Isn't this encouraging? And when wine is broken, an adder is hatched. They're cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds, and acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. They pursue evil schemes. Acts of violence mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their path. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks along them will know peace. So, Justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness, for brightness. But we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. At midday, we stumble, as if it were twilight. Among the strong, we're like the dead. We growl like bears. We moan mournfully like doves. We look for justice, but find none for deliverance, but it is far away. What a picture, pauses, what a picture of hopelessness that is, isn't it? Isn't that a dreadful picture that Isaiah is bringing before us? He goes on, for our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived, so justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. Whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. My goodness me, if that hasn't dragged you down, I don't know what will. 
Come on. It's a hopeless situation, isn't it? Do I hear it? Do I hear it? Yeah. It's a hopeless situation. Where are we going to go with this? What can we do? We are lost. We are in trouble. And then we read on. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. Here we go. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. In other words, God looks. He sees how helpless we are, how helpless humanity is. And he steps in and he intervenes. He brings an intervention. We can't fix it. We're so sinful. We're so wrecked. We're so ruined. And yet God steps into all of that and says, hey, I'll bring the solution. Come on, if I was preaching in Africa now, they'd be throwing chairs at me. That is the gospel. That is the Christmas message. We stack it up, however much tinsel we put on it. That's it. We're lost. We can't help ourselves. God can. He steps in. He does it. That's got to be worth a bit of celebration in the house of God. <laughs> but it's an intervention. It's an intervention. And that's what we need, and that's what this world needs today. We can't save ourselves, so God steps in and does the work for us. He sees that we lack the capacity to overcome sin and he intervenes. And my friend today, my brother, my sister, whoever you are at home or in the house, whatever issue you're facing, God can intervene. Nothing is hopeless. Nothing is hopeless in the economy of God and in the economy of the gospel. Nothing is hopeless. The cross is the intervention of God. So I want to pull out a few things out of this. Number one, the motivation for his intervention. The motivation for God's intervention is helpless. And it's in fact, that is the motivation for anybody's intervention. Helplessness. They are helpless. They need help. He was appalled, it says in verse 16, that there was no one to intervene. We had a barbecue a little while ago, a couple of years ago, and uh, we got two grand, well, we've got three granddaughters now. We had two granddaughters at the time. And uh, we're madly in love, by the way. So um, I've got some photos if you want to see. Up on the screen now. No, I'm kidding. Um, but we, 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 so we, and we're barbecue nuts. We love having barbecue. And so uh, the kids were around, had the barbecue going. And then one of, the, one of them brought up a little vole, right, that had been, uh, remember? <laughs> she brought up a little vole. And she said, oh, little baby vole, we found it. And he was alive, you know, little baby vole, just about alive. And, and she said, oh, where's, where's his mummy, you know, where's his mummy? And so we kind of said, oh, no, you know, what are we going to do? You know, poor little vole. So what we did was, we said, I tell you what, let's get the little vole and make a little nest. Hey. So we get the little vole and we get some um, tissue paper and stuff like that. And, and they go down to the hedge. We said, you better put it where, where you found it, because when its mummy comes looking for it, come on, work with me. When its mummy comes looking for it, you know, it needs to, she needs to know where to go. So we, we nestle it all, or they did, they nestled it all under the hedge and they fluffed up the thing and they put the little roll on it and he was all there and kind of all cute. Oh. And, and, and then we carried on with our barbecue and we said, we said to the to, to, to the girls, you know what? I'm sure the little vole's gone. And do you know what? Next morning we got up and the little vole was gone. I said, I don't know what's going through your mind, but as far as we're concerned, come on. Mummy came back for the vole, right? Right? You put those dark thoughts out of your mind. Mummy came back for the vole. But the point is this. They intervened. What, what do I mean by that? The vole was helpless. It couldn't do anything itself. It was completely helpless. It needed an external force to come in and bring hope into its existence and thus salvation. Helplessness motivates what I'm talking about. Intervention, that's the word. Helplessness. You look at these sponsored kids, and we've met many, haven't we, Paul? We've met many of these sponsored kids. They are helpless. I was with a guy called Ronnie. Ronnie, this is a couple of weeks ago, 
uh, I, I was preaching in a church, and Ronnie, a graduate, a child who'd been through the program, was there. And uh, he gave this definition of extreme poverty. I've never heard this put this way before. He said it is the inability to change anything in your life. Isn't that powerful? The inability to change anything in your life. I could not do anything. Nothing. I had no capability to bring any change whatsoever into my life. Into his life, God, through an individual, gets him sponsored. And you need to hold that thought for a moment or two. God used a person to step into his life to bring that change. He is motivated by our helplessness. So if you're here today and you're feeling helpless, be encouraged because God hears the voice of helplessness and brings in his intervention. Jesus sees the crowd. He has compassion on them. We read in Matthew 9, 36, because they were harassed and helpless. That word compassion, incidentally, is an interesting word. It doesn't translate well uh, into our refined English congregations. In fact, the authorized version uses the word bowels. Yeah, and we don't like talking about bowels in church when you preach because it doesn't hang well in the atmosphere. However, in this instance, I'm going to use the term bowel. I'm not, I'm not going to try and let... Well, I've got it here. Slangnid zamahi. Slangnid zamahi. That is the Greek word that we translate into compassion, but actually it's bowels, it's intestine. And what, why am I focusing on this? The reason is, is because your bowels work in an involuntary way. They just work. You don't have to tell them to do anything. They just work. When you feel genuine compassion, it is involuntary. You've got to do something about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not a refined English, oh, I say, I feel compassionate today. I'm feeling great compassion for you. It's not like that at all. It's like I am motivated into action. I could amplify that, but I'm not going to. You'll be very grateful, very pleased to know. Richmond said one word, summed him up, hopeless. Number two, the method of intervention. God uses a man or a woman. He uses a human, an individual. He sent a man. Christmas time, we're going to be remembering that. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And then we read in 1 Timothy 2.5, there's one God and one mediator between God and ma mankind. Who is it? The man, Jesus. The man, Jesus. God uses people. That's why the church is so important. That's why freedom is so important. Freedom church. Because God uses people. The best shot this community of God is the church. Because God lives in us. And he can't get to people unless we go to people. He can't do anything unless we... You know, we've been doing my utmost for his highest. Um, not Selwyn Hughes, it is Oswald Chambers. And I've been reading through that how important it is to let the Jesus in me free. You know what I mean? I can suppress Jesus real good on a bad day. I can, I can block him out when he wants me to do something. And yet real maturity in our faith is when we let Jesus free. We let him loose to do what he wants to do. And let me tell you, he can transform this community through this group of people in this room. If we can just let him go and not hold him back, my word, this place would be different, wouldn't it? It was a man who went to the cross. It was a man who was exhausted to the point of death. It was a man that healed, delivered, loved and blessed. It's a man right now at the right hand of God because God sent his son who became a man but he didn't change him back into his original form it is still a man with nail prints that intercedes for you and i today god intervened through a man god's passion for us is for us because we're made in his likeness body soul and spirit i'm going to spin through to my final point 
the moment of intervention. Now. God is a now God, I've learned. In all my years of preaching and all the stuff I've done, there's a moment in time when God moves. I've seen so many people leave meetings disappointed because they didn't take the opportunity God gave them. Do you know what? I've left meetings disappointed because I didn't take the opportunity God gave me. And so as we pray in a moment or two, and we're going we're gonna to let rubber hit the road with this, because um, who is it who said Spurgeon? The beginning of sermon is the application. If, if we just want a little lecture today, we've missed the point of the gospel. God is a now God. In the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I help you. Paul says what? He says now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. If you listen to this and you never committed your life to Christ, now is the time to do it. If you listen to this online and you're wondering, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? Let me tell you, now is the time. Why? Because you can talk yourself out of it. Because when the moment passes, you've missed it. Jesus at the wedding at Cana, what did they say to him? They said, you saved the best till now. It is now. Even God's name is a now name. He, he, Yahweh doesn't mean I was or I will be. It means I am now. It's a now thing. Do you feel today, I wonder if your life needs an intervention? I saw a sign outside a church that said this, God is nowhere. And I looked at it and thought, that's a crazy sign to put outside a church. God is nowhere. Until I saw how clever it was, God is now here. Could have used your English grammar. God is nowhere. God is now here. He's here in this room now. Right now, Jesus is here. Right right now, you know because you can feel a stirring, and you know because he's speaking to you, and you know because you can feel it in your heart. He's here right now. Now, what is your need? Are you going to bring it to him? Are you going to bring it to him? Can we just stand in this house today? Before they call, I will answer. While they're still speaking, I will hear. I wonder today, let's bow our heads. I want to say, what is your intervention? What is the need that you have? What is it? Come on, bring it to him right now. Come on, engage with him right now. Engage with him. Is it a family member? Is it a situation that you're struggling with? Is it a, is it a guilt thing that you don't know how to resolve? Is it maybe, is it something, have you never given your life to Christ? Is it that you, you're, you're helpless and lost and, feel like a car with no brakes. What is it? What is it? What is it? Bring it to him right now. Ask him for intervention. Jesus, intervene in my life. I'm helpless. I can't fix it. This is beyond me. It's too big for me. It's too big. I've tried to sort this thing out. I've tried to help that person. I, I, the doctor have tried to help me. Intervene now, I pray. Intervene now, I ask, right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. As I pray, I'm going to make two appeals instead. As I pray, I want you to engage in my prayer. If you And you guys at home as well, you're not off the hook. If, if God's speaking to you, respond. Here we go. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every heart that's reaching out to you today. I thank you. You're a God that hears the cry of helplessness. I thank you that at this Christmas, Lord, we see the intervention, the intervening arm of God. And I pray, Lord, that whatever the need that is brought to you today, before you today, I pray, Lord, that every heart and soul that reaches out will hear the amen in heaven and feel your arm around their shoulder and will hear the word, all is well. 
all is well. I pray for those that need to let go of something and need to, in, in order to take something. I pray for those, Lord, that need to release something in order to gain something. I pray, Lord, that you'll give them strength to let the thing go. That is a word for somebody here today, incidentally. Let it go. You know who you are. Let it go. So that you can receive from his hand. Here we go. End of the first. If you agree with me, two, three. Amen. Second appeal is this. Second appeal is we have the capacity to intervene for others. We can make a difference. God uses men and women to bring his intervention into the world. And you could be the answer to somebody's prayer. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that as we stand here today, Lord, the neighbor that needs help, the person down the road that needs help, maybe when we're shopping and the, the, the woman behind the till seems a bit forlorn and low, uh, for the person, the mum outside the school gate, Father, I pray that we will intervene. That we will be Jesus in that situation. That we, Lord, will not shy back, but as you look for someone to stand in the gap, we will be there and stand in the gap. And Father, I pray with all my heart for the 350 to 450 million children who have no hope God, who they, they have no ability to change anything. I pray, Father, for them, that for those of us in this room today or those in earshot who can help, not through guilt from a preacher, not because they feel pressured by some external force, but those, Lord, of us who have been given grace, who can help. I pray in Jesus' name that we will stand in the gap for those children today and make a difference. I pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.